personally, depending on the environment, I actually find keyloggers, hardware-based keyloggers, to be the easier way to crack passwords. Devices like the one you see here simply sit between a USB keyboard and the system itself and capture and store all keystrokes on the system. You leave this in place for a couple of days, you come back and pick it up, and you've got almost certainly every password or, and everything that the user typed, but almost certainly passwords. Because it sits between the keyboard and the system, it's limited to desktop machines. It doesn't work really well on laptops unless someone's using an external laptop keyboard and at the same time doesn't really notice a, an extra black dongle hanging off it. But at the same time, it works right all the way through Windows or really any system at all because you're sniffing at the hardware level. It's transparent. It doesn't require drivers in most cases. It doesn't expose anything, really. The only way this thing gets detected is if someone is looking behind their computer on a regular basis at the connections. And even still, in most cases, it just kind of vanishes into the array of wires and connectors on the back of the system. It's a really transparent attack using this kind of hardware-based keylogger. Software-based keyloggers, on the other hand, are a little different. They're essentially just malware. And there's an entire video series on malware coming up, but you'll see that malware is a little bit easier for an administrator to prevent and for someone to detect and remediate and certainly sets off a lot more alarm bells. So if you have physical access to a system and you're looking to compromise passwords, generally speaking, the easiest way is to plant one of these key loggers. And then the only trick really is getting back. You have to be there to plant it. You have to let it sit for a little while and you have to get back and retrieve it, put it in your own system and then extract all of the data. Once you've got that data though, you almost certainly have passwords and you can use all of those passwords for further attacks without any really other work at all. You've got the password in clear text on your system. So non-technical password hacking is a little bit different. There's a lot of different attacks against passwords that are based not at all on cryptographic hashes or based on key loggers or based on spyware. One of the easiest ways, frankly, is actually to just ask. So this is a picture of my mother and my mother, when she wants something, she tells me to just ask nicely and I'll get it. Well, that's cool. If I want something and I ask nicely and I get it, that's awesome. And in fact, this actually works really, really well with a lot of types of, of passwords, depending on the user, depending on the context, depending on how skilled you are at social engineering, because that's essentially what it is. You're generally not going to say, hey, I'm an ethical hacker. Can you give me your password? What you may do is impersonate someone or pretend or, or offer them maybe a bribe, whether that's a bar of chocolate or some money. And if you're laughing at the bar of chocolate, there's been a lot of studies that show that users will actually give up their passwords for things like bars of chocolate if they don't think that there's any harm in it. Another social engineering attack that you'll see in the social engineering video is against passwords, just compromising passwords. It's actually pretty darn easy by social engineering, simply manipulating people into giving it. I do an example of a reverse social engineering attack to get a password. I attack this user's computer with a USB drive that's got some malware on it that actually installs a key logger, all that kind of fun stuff. So there's those are definitely other interesting ways to get passwords. Standing behind a user and watching when they type in a password, you'd be surprised how effective this is because very, very few people think that this is a problem. Uh, it works on laptops just as well as desktops. That seems kind of obvious. I've been on airplanes. I've been in airports. I've been in public transportation where I just look over and there's a user that whips out a laptop, opens it up, and I can watch them type in their password. Kind of crazy. In fact, in uh, one case on an airplane, I watched a user type in a password and that password was on the list of passwords that you saw earlier, verbatim. And I wasn't looking really hard and I don't have great eyesight. So if that kind of shoulder surfing works, imagine if you're directing a shoulder surfing attack, you're actually positioning yourself so that you can watch users type in their passwords. And dumpster diving. This is really the concept of going into the garbage and looking for people's passwords because they often write them down or their manager resets their password and writes it down, or a new employee comes on board and their password is written down. 
just looking through the trash can actually be really useful, depending, of course, on whether the company shreds documents, whether the company has some kind of secured garbage, and whether the garbage is really smelly. Because if the garbage is really smelly, you probably want to look at one of these other types of attacks. So once any of these attacks have been successful and you've got some level of privilege on a system, you can use that privilege to expand your privilege. So you can actually use what little you get, what little leverage you get, to get more and more and more access to systems. And that's actually really, really cool. It's just more and more rare as time goes on. So this isn't necessarily the best thing to count on. For example, if there are 10 user accounts that I've got password hashes for, and I know two of them are administrator accounts and eight of them are user accounts, I certainly want to prioritize attacking the administrator accounts first because the user accounts may give me some access, but I'm probably going to need more access. Having said that, it is possible to take that regular user access and expand it to be an administrator or to run arbitrary code or to conduct the attack I need to conduct. The, the drawback there is that these types of opportunities, these flaws, whether it's in an operating system or an application or network stack or whatever it is, these are, these are flaws that are almost always patched as soon as they're found by the vendor. So Microsoft being the biggest one, when they see a vulnerability that allows privilege escalation, that's an immediate patch. That's one of those patches that comes out in the middle of the month. When patches aren't really supposed to come out, this is the kind of patch that comes out. So you've got to pounce on that almost immediately. If you're in the middle of an, an attack type where you're actually brute forcing and you didn't get a highly privileged account yet, but you've got some unprivileged accounts, if you see this kind of vulnerability popping up, whether it is through the vendor itself or through a hacker site or through some newswire, you pounce on it immediately because it's probably going to give you access long enough to make sure you get more access later and then it doesn't matter whether it gets patched or not.